Come on in, pull up a chair, and take a load off, because today I'll be sharing a bit about how to play and reviewing Richard III, The Wars of the Roses from Columbia Games. So, is this still a classic Fog of War block game a decade after its release? Or have 10 years of game design and mechanical advancements left dick in the dust? You'll find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer, back once again as your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I am going to be reviewing Richard III, The Wars of the Roses from Columbia Games. And of course, this did come out about 10 years ago. On a side note, before I jump in, I do also want to mention that Richard III is available digitally now. That's right, from Columbia Games for PC and Mac. I'm not positive if it's out there for Linux or not, but I do know it is available for PC and Mac. But today, we are talking about the board game. Because Richard III, The Wars of the Roses, as I mentioned, is from Columbia Games, designed by Tom Douglas and Jerry Taylor, with art and graphic design provided by Tom Douglas, Mark Mahaffey, and Leona Preston. Game is for two players, ages 12 and up, Plays in around two hours. It does carry an MSRP of $69.99. So let's swing on over to the other camera and take a look at Richard III. Alrighty, so I have Richard III, The Wars of the Roses, laid out here. We're going to take a, a peek at the how to play. I am not going to get into every tiny little optional aspect of this game i'm going to give you pretty much an overview of how you play richard the third so the first thing we're going to do let's take a look at the map so we will zoom in in just a moment get a little closer look i really do love the way the board is set up this just really has a very nice visual appeal to it it's it's a little busy but all of these Heraldry shields represent something important for the game. They represent the noble houses that can be recruited in these areas. So they, that needs to be there. We also have cities that are marked. We also have uh, religious areas as well, areas that the church effectively controls. Well, let's take a peek because this, uh, this board is a little bit bigger than I can squeeze into the camera frame here on the table. It overlaps a little bit but not a ton. So to kind of give you an idea, so we've got England into Scotland. We've got a little bit of Ireland as well. We've got Calais down here, but the vast majority of your action is going to be taking place in England. You'll notice that we've got these areas all marked off by borders. One thing I will point out, this is not an area control war game. This is, which will surprise some people because a lot of times, a game of this scale, controlling an area is important to final victory. That is not the case with Richard III. Now, of course, controlling an area does help you because it makes the area friendly to your forces. Plus, if it is an opposing noble's area, then your opponent cannot recruit that noble if you're controlling that area. So. Just kind of give you a little bit of an idea here. So let's zoom in a little bit. We'll get a little closer look at the map. Then we're going to look at some of the blocks. We're going to take a look at the cards. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the rules of the game, too. Rulebook is very short. It is to the point. It is pretty clear. Now, I have played other Fog of War block games from Columbia Games. So a lot of this came pretty naturally to me. There are a few tweaks that are a little bit different in Richard III than in some of the other games that I've played, like Julius Caesar, as well as uh, Stonewall. I think it's called Stonewall. I'm almost positive. 
Uh, anyway, this, the American Civil War game, which there are a few block games from Columbia that do co cover the American Civil War. So if you're not familiar with a Fog of War game, you're going to find that your units are going to be blocks which face you so that your opponent cannot see what exactly that unit is or the strength of that unit. Now, that being said, once you start fighting battles and discovering who you're going up against, you can try to remember where that block goes so you have an idea. All right, so let's zoom in a little bit. We're going to take a look at uh we're going to take a look at the cards. So also give you a better look at uh yeah, better look at the map as well. So let's uh let's see if we can sharpen this up just a touch. There we go. That looks good. Okay. So one of the first things that you're going to see is we've got the different areas, right? So We've got these these shields, the heraldry, and of course it's going to match the heraldry that we've got on the different blocks. So that means that that's where, for an example, uh, where are we looking? Of course, now I'm not going to see it. So right there, there we go. So this noble, this block can be recruited here. That's where that block can be recruited. This is uh, an important noble as well to the uh, House of York. House of York is white, and uh, the king is red. So it is Henry the Sixth. So I'm going to lay some of these blocks out because we're going to take a look at these. I'm, I'll actually zoom in a bit so we can get a better look at these too. But the game is effectively card driven. And each of the players is going to receive a hand of seven cards. This is a campaign game in essence because the Wars of the Roses, you'll notice it is the plural, the Wars of the Roses, because the, the fighting was interspace. There, it, was, it was stop and go. It was not a continuous war that went on for years and years. It, Fighting would break out, then it would subside, and then all of a sudden it would break out again. So this effectively kind of boils down to three games of seven turns. Or you can just say the game lasts 21 turns, but you also have three, I don't want to say scoring phases, but uh, victory phases. And I will mention that when we get into that. So one thing on the map here, you do see that we've got different colored borders. So we've got the yellow border can have four units pass over it in a single turn. A blue border can have three units pass over. And a red border, which we have over here, you can only move two across and your units must stop. Because if you're doing a normal move, you can move up to two areas. Unless you cross a red border, then your units will have to stop. So everybody's going to have, each of the players are going to have a hand of seven cards. And if you have played many card-driven games in the past, you're going to see that we have action points. Some games call these operational points, but these are action points. We also have some events as well that can be played. So each of the players is going to lay down, face down, a card from their hand of seven each turn. They're going to flip these cards over. They're going to reveal the action points on the card. And whoever uh, has the highest number will be the first player. In the, in the case of a tie then the pretender will go first. Who begins as uh, the pretender is the House of York. So the House of York is the pretender. And of course, we have the Plantagenets as the, uh, as the royal family. So with these action points, you can do a few things. You can, you can use an action point to move. So you can move any blocks that are in an area 
as many as you want that are in a single area. So for an example, if I had three blocks in Chester and I played this, one of my action points I could utilize and move them to, let's say, Derby and then into South York. I could easily do that if I'd like to. I can spend a point and just move it one. I can move it up to two now. Remember, if I were moving across, say, a red border, then I only get the one move and then I have to stop with my forces. There is a stacking limit for each of the areas. It is four blocks. After four blocks, then you're going to start to uh, suffer attrition as well. So you can move. You can recruit. So we've got all of these other blocks. Of course, I did not actually set this game up like a first turn because we're not going to actually play through an entire you know, campaign or anything. Just kind of giving you an idea. So as an example, let's say uh, I am the Plantagenet player. I am the king player. And I decide, okay, well, I'm going to play... I wouldn't play treason yet. I'm going to play that card. Okay, so it shows a four. Now you will see, like for an example, this is Henry Tudor. Whoever's on this, the personality that's on it, has nothing to do with anything in the game. All you're caring about is the four. So for an example, any card that has Henry Tudor on it is actually four action points. So let's say I played that, and I want to, I want to recruit. And I've got this block Shrewsbury as far as this noble. I have not recruited them. So I'd say, okay, I'm spending an action point, and I will recruit. And then I would actually take this noble that's sitting off on the side. And if we see right there is that shield. And then I would place them there. Now, uh, once I recruit a unit, I can't do anything with that unit for the rest of the turn. So what we are trying to do is lay it face down. So there's a few different things you'll, we were doing. I mean, it's not in the rules, but we were doing this. Uh, for an example, when you've got uh, these borders with a limit to how many units can cross over, we would make sure that we just kind of left a little bit of the block just touching, just going over that border where it came from. Now, for an example like this, Let's say I was moving four blocks. Well, that's a pretty tight squeeze there. We would just kind of have stacked it like that. Always remember, you're trying to make sure that your opponent can't see what's on these blocks until you enter battle. So you can use the points to move. You can use the points to actually do C movement as well. All of these coastal areas are considered to have ports. This is considered a major port. So, for an example, I can move Lincoln from Lincoln to C, and I can move just one block for my one action point to do a C move. If I were coming from a major port, then I could effectively move two. So that's, a, that's all that means. I can move two blocks into or out of major ports I can only move one into in a turn with my action point. So, so effectively, what you're going to do is you're going to spend your action points. So as an example here, if these were the two cards that got laid out, this player is going first, the king player is going first, and then the pretender player would go second. You're going to spend all your, your action points, and then... Anytime you've got uh, units that are in the same, there are enemy units that are going to be in the same area, you're going to have a battle. So let's say for an example, okay, say we've got, say we've got these. The first player is going to determine the, because you'll, you'll have multiple battles in, in a turn, usually. So the first player gets to determine what order you're going to resolve those battles in. So I'm going to zoom in a little closer again, and we're going to take a look at these blocks. I'll kind of explain how the battles work. So uh, as far as victory for this game, 
there are two ways to achieve victory. So first off, and I will, yeah, let's, let's get closer in here. And let's sharpen this up. There we go. All right, that looks pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few different things on these blocks. In fact, I'm going to grab a quick sip here because I've been yapping away. <laughs> Okay, so as far as these blocks go, you will see if it is a crown, this crown means that this is either the king or an heir to the throne. And you will see a number, right? So here, Henry VI is king. Prince Edward is second in line. So the heir to the throne. So if Henry is killed, then Prince Edward will become king. And uh, you will have five uh, in succession. So you'll have five uh, possibilities of rulers on the throne. So we've got that. We also have these roses. We'll either have red or we will have white. So just like so. These mean these are critical noble houses. If this block is eliminated, this noble is removed from the game. This only will, uh, this only applies, uh, applies is the word I was looking for, this only applies to units that have the roses. There are also five of these. One of the ways to win <coughs> is if you have removed if you destroyed all five of your opponent's nobles that have the rose then that's an automatic victory the other way to win is to be king at the end of the game so i will explain that once i kind of cover this all right so uh there are different kinds of units as well so we've got nobles we've got irish you can recruit the irish to rise up uh, we've got bombards as well. There are mercenaries. There are levies. And uh, there are also uh, rebels. We can have rebels that rise up. But for the, for the vast majority of the blocks you're going to be using, you are going to be using blocks that show heraldry on them. So let's explain a little more about what these blocks show. So here we also see these diamonds, these pips. So this is the strength of this block, this unit. So the king commands a pretty, pretty strong, pretty large uh, army, in essence. So we have four pips. Prince Edward, a little bit smaller. His is three. Richmond's three. Clifford's three. Kent's three. So when you recruit units that are not automatically out on the board when you start the game, you always make sure that you have them facing you, standing up with the highest strength showing. Now, during battle, that strength can be depleted, uh, as well as if you have too many blocks in a location through the attrition. And then there are event cards as well. So that's what though that represents. That is the strength. We also have, if we take a look here, we see there's a number in that upper left. This number is a number one. So one of the aspects of the Wars of the Roses were some of these nobles would switch sides. Uh, and that is, you know, in this game, it's treachery. So it is possible if you have the king or the pretender, or one other specific noble in a battle, and the opponent has units that show this number, it is possible to make an attempt to recruit them and have them switch sides. Now, there is an extra uh, block as well in red as opposed to white. So if they, if they were to you know, switch sides, so on and so forth. 
So there's that. There's that. There's treachery there. Uh, there are some. Basically, see this number one. That's actually you need to roll a one on a six-sided die, and then they would switch sides. Uh, we have higher numbers than that. So, uh, but for the most, like for an example, here we go, Warwick, which is actually the. Uh, the I want to say this is this is also the uh, the other unit that can make somebody switch sides. But the thing is. They're not very reliable either. There are three, so a three or less on a six-sided die moves them into your column. So uh, that's one of the aspects I really do like about the game because it does does portray the treachery, uh, the backstabbing that was going on without being really too rules-intensive as far as that goes. Right, so the other thing we're going to look at here is we're going to look at this... The letter and the number. So we're going to see A's, we're going to see B's, we're going to see C's. So let's kind of put these like so. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Let's say we've got a battle. And the A's represents how quickly they're going to attack. So A's attack before B's. B's attack before C's and so forth now also you have the defender same thing same thing will happen in that respect the defending a goes before b b goes before c so what you end up doing is you'll have the a's with theirs and you're going to roll a number of dice equal to the strength pips so for an example this unit would be a1, so I get three dice. I need to roll a one on any of these dice for hits. All right, we got nothing. We got zip, zilch, zero. So then, for an example, then we would have the A's on this side. So we've got A2s. So we would roll three dice for here. Oh, look at that. We got two hits. So these two hits, you're going to assign hits to the strongest units. Uh, of your opponent. Now, if there is a tie for the strongest units, then you're actually going to uh, allow that player to choose who takes what. The attacker normally does not get to pick who's going to lose the strength points. So let's say we lost the two. So we're going to drop. Uh, ooh, crap. Well, I guess we could go with uh, Warwick. So remember, these are normally facing up, right? So this would be facing like this to me later on if that's all that happened. All right, so we've got, we've got that. We still have another A2. Oh, wow, two more hits. So here we go. Now I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to drop Norfolk down to, and then... We would move on to the B's. So once again, we got B2, B2s, that's B3, B3. So we'd have these two units. Now, this one's at full strength, so that's three. Wow, bad dice, bad dice so far. Nothing there. And then we get two. Wow, nothing. This is not a battle that is <laughs> working out well for the pretender here. Anyway, so you'll you'll continue, and then as you're you're losing these uh, strength steps, uh, you can start once once you get past the first round of battle, you can start deciding. Okay, well, I'm going to start retreating. So you can start retreating units out of the battle. So it's not it's not a case where you're sitting there and you're like, oh well, we're fighting to the death here. No, but the problem is, I mean. Even early on, this is just, this is a massacre going on down here. Because we still have these bees to roll. So, this would, uh, this is pretty much uh, a meat grinder going on as far as the pretender is concerned. So, once you no longer have any units that are continuing to fight, whoever still holds a location would be considered, is considered friendly. Regardless if it's uh, 
if it's already for the king or for the pretender. If you have units there, that is a friendly area. Otherwise, they're unoccupied, rel relatively neutral. Although you can recruit from areas that don't have any blocks, right? So if you had, uh, if you had nobles on your side that you wanted to recruit, if there's no enemy unit in there, you can recruit them. One of the things that you'll find uh, works very well is uh, to start laying out in areas to make sure that your opponent cannot recruit various different nobles. All right, so anyway, so we finish up with the battles. Then we continue along until everybody's played. Each of the players have played their seven cards. Once you've played the seven cards, then you go into a political phase. So essentially the political phase is you're just taking a look who controls the most nobles. So all you're going to do is count up the different heraldry shields for units that you've recruited, not for this, anything that's off the board that you haven't recruited yet. You're going to count up the number of heraldry shields. This would not count. That's a levy. This would not count. Uh, whoever controls London gets a plus one. Uh, you get plus one for the church. So whoever's got the highest score is now king. So you can see things switch back and forth. Remember, you're going to play essentially three mini games of seven cards to determine who's going to be king. So at the end of the third round, so once you've gone through the third round of, uh, or actually I should say like third era, probably sounds a little better. Then once again, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to count up the noble houses that you have allied with you and whoever holds the most is considered king. So pretty easy, pretty easy as far as uh, this goes. Now, one thing that throws some people off is the combat because with the lettering and who goes first, you know, attackers, defenders, and then you know, retreating, things like that, uh, can be a little tricky, especially if you not played any of the Fog of War block games from Columbia. But once you get the hang of it, super, super easy. One thing I will mention, though, is there's a little bit of imbalance in this game. It's not horrible. It's not terrible. But there is some imbalance where actually the House of York player has an advantage because early on in the first turn, if the York player uh, gets good cards, they can effectively go and, and start wiping out very easily some of the kings, nobles that have the rows. So it's important for the king player to, in the, in the first round of the game, to go first and to try to retreat some of these units that are exposed, some of these rose units that are exposed. Once you do that, then it's game on. Uh, but it can, it can play out where you just don't get great cards in your first round and the York player just goes to town on you. Then automatically, right from the start, you're kind of kind of behind the eight ball. So I do point that out. Uh, some people out there might want to create some little like a uh, house rules regarding that. Maybe make sure that the, uh, the king player, the Plantagenet player, has a couple of fours in their hand, maybe, or that in the first turn the Plantagenet player gets to go first automatically. However you want to do it, uh, we'll even that up a little bit. It's not terribly un unbalanced, but you will notice it once you play this a few different times. Speaking of playing this a few different times, you really do need to get some plays under your belt before some of the cool little aspects of this game come to the fore. Uh, and like I said, I'm not going to get into every single aspect of the game because this 
It's already been a lot longer than I was planning. But uh, I really like this. It's very simple to teach other people to get into. It is a great gateway war game. Uh, it is a, an excellent fog of war game. There's a reason why Columbia Games has so many really highly rated fog of war games out there because they're easy to get into. They've got meat on their bones and they're all a little bit different. They don't play exactly the same. For an example, one of the, one of the aspects here is that you can't resupply your, your units. You can't replace strength points that you've lost in this game. Once you've lost those strength points, that's it. Now, if this unit, say, got wiped out, then they're placed off board face down. Now, they'll, they'll return in the like, next campaign, right? Rem remember, we got the three kind of eras, the three campaigns. So they'll be available again to be recruited in the next campaign, if there is one. Whereas if it is a Rose unit, they are removed from the game permanently. They're permanently out. So you have to be very careful about leaving units out or making sure that some vulnerable units have higher strength units with them when, uh, when you end up in battle. Because uh, it, can, it can turn the tide very, very quickly. All right. Uh, other thing that I probably will mention is, uh, and I kind of touched on this, you do have a succession. So if, for an example, this crown is removed from the game, then that means the king is dead and the king is replaced with the next in succession. Uh, another aspect, too, is that's kind of cool, is if your noble is defending their home location, they actually get a bonus to their firepower on the defense, only on the defense. Uh, so, there's, like I said, there's a few little kind of, I don't want to say optional rules, but there are little aspects to the game that make this very cool that I'm not going to go into each and every small little one. Needless to say, I really like this. So let's pop on over to the other camera, and I will give you my final thoughts and the review score. All right, so there is a bit of a how to play, and look at Richard III, The Wars of the Roses from Columbia Games. Allow me to sum up my final thoughts and give this a review score. First off, I do want to point out that dating all the way back to when Gen Con was held in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I have yet to ever play a Fog of War block game from Columbia Games that I didn't really like. All the way back then, it was Sam Grant, and of course, since then, I have reviewed Julius Caesar, as well as Shannon Doa, and now Richard III. I like this system. It's very easy to get into. It's got enough meat on its bones to be entertaining and feel like a war game without burying you with various rule systems and combat result charts and things like that. So this makes an excellent gateway game to bring in an 11, 12, 13-year-old into the genre of conflict simulations without scaring them off, right? You got these blocks. They look cool. You got the heraldry on it. Looks cool, right? My nephew Cameron jumped right on into this. Took him a little while to understand the game, but he definitely really enjoyed his experience while we were playing a few times between the two of us. Of course, he didn't win, but say la vie, maybe one day. So I do like this system quite a bit. Another aspect of it I like is that even though the core remains the same, there are plenty of wrinkles to the game designs for each title to make them unique. One aspect of this design I really like is area control really doesn't matter that much. Unless you're controlling London, which is worth an additional noble point, or you're trying to deny your opponent the ability to recruit nobles from a specific region, You'll see armies just moving all over England. And uh, this is really a slugfest, too, because you're looking at kind of the main point is to wipe out your opponent's units. Sitting back and trying to turtle is not going to <laughs> crown you king by any stretch of the imagination. Because, of course, if you remove those five rose blocks from your opponent, that's an automatic win. And, of course, 
for every block you knock out. But you're also looking at that's one less noble your opponent controls. So anyway, really, really like it. As far as component quality, the blocks are really nice. They're uniform cut. We can't say that about every block game we see. Sometimes there's some variation with, with the blocks that are supposed to all be the same size. That is not the case here. Uh, as far as uh, the board, I love the graphic design of the game board. I do wish it was a mounted board, especially seeing that this is a $69.99 MSRP on Richard III. I wish there was a, a mounted board in there. And I understand some people do not like mounted boards because where they live, it's very humid and tends to warp. I get that. But at this price point, I do think there should be a mounted board. Also, as far as the rules, the rules are pretty easy to get into, but they are showing their age a little bit because nowadays we tend to see many more examples of play, color illustrations, usually, especially I, I'm going to toss out GMT games as an example, but we tend to see our rules for war games kind of pop a little more than uh, say Richard the thirds do that said, it is certainly not a rule book that you open up and you're, you feel like it's 1980 and you've just cracked open an Avalon Hill or SBI title by any stretch. So just little tweaks of the rule book. I would like this just, a little easier to understand, right? Thankfully, I've played this system before. Granted, it had been a while, been a couple of years since I'd played uh, any of the block games. I think it was Julius Caesar I played last. And uh, it came right back to me. But I could see some folks who are brand new to wargaming might have a little bit of difficulty getting their heads wrapped around a couple of little aspects in the rules. Nothing major, just would have liked to have seen the rules. It's a little clearer in some respects. I gotta be honest, if this came with a mounted board, as well as maybe a little bit of a tweak on the rule book, I would certainly give this a 10 out of 10. It is that good. I, but then again, I gotta say, I really enjoy these Fog of War block games. So that said, because it doesn't have the mounted board, and the rules could use a little tweak, I'm gonna give it a little bit of a ding, but not much. So on a scale of uh, 1 to 10, I do give Richard III, The Wars of the Roses, a very, very solid 9.3 out of 10. I also do want to point out, I'll remind you once again, the digital version of Richard III is available from Columbia Games too. So you might want to check that out. Anyway, all in all, I really think Richard III really holds up very, very nicely and makes a perfect gateway game, both the younger gamers as well as other gamers who are looking to get their foot in the door as far as war games and conflict simulations. All right, so that's it for this time out. Don't forget, don't miss me right here on YouTube, Mondays through Fridays at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time for the Daily Dope as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news. And of course, if you like the video, please give it a quick thumbs up. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please do. And if you do, don't forget, ring that little bell because it will notify you not only when I upload standalone videos such as this, it'll also tell you when the Daily Dope goes live. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill. Get your geek out at thegaminggang.com. All right, I am done for this time out. So until next time, happy trails. Zibit. Whoa, hey. <laughs> I didn't realize that you were still here. Well, if that's the case, then allow me to share the following information with you that I only have 20 seconds to do. So let's all take a deep breath. <sighs> so if you would like to subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel, please click right here. If you want to check out the latest episode of The Daily Dope, click right here. 
And if you'd like to check out a randomly selected standalone video, by all means, click right here. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer, and thanks for watching.